This cylindrical cardboard form is referred to as a sonotube. Now that's the same sort of a principle as calling a tissue, a facial tissue, a Kleenex. Sonotube was about the first to the party and started making essentially giant toilet paper roll holders coated with wax on the inside so that the water from the cement mixture does not soften uh, the cardboard as it's coming up to strength. But they're just super handy. They come in a wide range of um, diameters from about six or eight inch up to probably, I, I've dealt with them as much as three feet. I don't know if they make them any bigger than that or not. It's an interesting thing that the hydrostatic form pressure does not increase as a function of the circumference or the diameter, I'm sorry, of the diameter of the uh, column, but only as the height of the pore. So they can make these things as big as is practical to make. But they're used in a wide range of applications. You can cut them down and make little short piers. You can use them full length, which is ordinarily 10 feet, to pour columns in a patio or in a gazebo or in a sports stadium or for a pier that's going to be buried underground. It has to get down to a real solid bearing condition and comes up and anywhere you need a concrete column and you don't want to build a square box, you can use a sauna tube. So what these are going to be doing is holding up a street light. Street lights are expensive. If this street light was attached to a footing down on grade, the first time somebody pulled in here with a trailer backing into one of these storage yards and hit the street light, it's time for a new street light. But when you set a street light 36 inches up on an 18 inch diameter concrete column with number five verts, uh, six of them around that circumference, it's time for a new bumper, it's time for the new tail light on the trailer and the street light doesn't even know he was hit. So that's sort of the structural advantage of getting these things up off the ground. There's quite a few things going on here in this little forming system. And as you can see, this is a, a rough, almost a barbaric approach to forming these, but it doesn't matter. The things that have to happen with a sauna tube is, it has to be kept dry. If you set up your sauna tube form and don't put visqueen over it and it rains that night, don't make the mistake of pouring it full of concrete in the morning because the paper is going to be soft and the glue will fail and it's going to split out. So you got to keep it dry. You try to install it so you can read the printing. That way, the way that the lap on the um, helical overlap of the wrap of the paper will unwind easily when you're stripping it. Now two of these we have them upside down because we wanted factory edges up in the air and it was the other end of the tube. So we'll just fight the stripping a little bit, but in general, keep them dry, have the print so you can read it, and brace them securely enough that you don't have to worry about them falling over. Now in this application we drilled 18 inch holes into the ground and slipped the sauna tube down in there enough to sort of restrain the bottom. You can pour these things freestanding. You can set it on the ground and pour it full of concrete if you're there to hold it and nobody hits it. And that's kind of legitimate. I mean, if you've just got one or two, you can pour them, you can bump them around, you can plumb them and make sure that they've taken a set before you leave the job that night and they'll be fine. But since we've got six and I don't want to have to be going back and forth and checking for plumb, they need to be braced in place. The rebar cages in here are husky. Number five verts, number four rings, hoops tied on there, they're really strong. And when they're cased in 18 inches of concrete, this is going to be virtually immovable, which is what you want. The rebar is set in the right position down below grade, and then will be plumb or clearance will be maintained as the dirt is going in. I don't really have anything in here holding the location of the rebar, so that's going to be taken care of as the concrete's placed. The bolt templates hold the rebar assembly inside the circumference of the rebar cage. Did I say that right? The bolts are restrained and held in their exact position by the template and it is inside the rebar cage so it's constrained. The conduit which has the wiring is held in the center of the light pole which is where it needs to be for the wire to go up. So this is all very specific. The form work is rough. All it has to be is strong. It does not have to be pretty because it's all going to be thrown away. But it has to be strong enough. The first pieces bridge the trench to hold the sauna tube at the right elevation. The next pieces attach to the side of the sauna tube so a brace can be attached with screws. You try to do this with a nail, you knock the world apart, it's no good. But on the other hand, you're just screwing into cardboard. So I run a piece of tie wire around there to hold that, I'll call it a ledger, it's not exactly a ledger, but to hold that piece against the cardboard with something other than the two screws. The braces are put in place, 
tied back to the round, sorry, concrete stakes. This piece is a spacer to hold the template above the level of the concrete where it has to be struck off and finished and to anchor the bolt template in its position. This is a brace to hold the other side of the template up and to provide a little triangulation, keep everything where it goes. We're going to protect the wire, we're going to be ready to pour these things and they will strip in a heartbeat, which is part of good form work. Strong enough to hold, light enough to be demolished with, the, uh, with a minimum of effort. So to keep the concrete from filling up the screw heads, I fill up the screw heads with Crisco. Now this desert is probably going to melt that Crisco and it'll just be a little puddle of oil. Whereas in Oregon, the Crisco stays kind of stiff and holds the material out. But in any case, I think this is going to help so that when I have to pull these forms apart while the concrete's still green, I can get my Torx screwdriver tip in there and not have to dig the concrete out first. It's a good tip. It'll save you some struggle at a critical moment when you just don't have time to mess around with cleaning out a screw head. You could use a grease gun and petroleum grease, but then pretty soon it's all over everything and you got a mess that is even worse than the concrete. And Crisco is just not that big a deal. We're pouring these right out of the truck. Obviously no pump is required, but perhaps it's not obvious that the opening that's left by the time we get braces and templates and bolts suspended in the middle of an 18 inch diameter hole is small. It's essentially raked in almost one shovel full at a time, which builds in a lot of lead time. It's forcing us to use a somewhat higher slump than we might choose. Also, we're doing that because we want a nicely consolidated face and we're not vibrating, we're just rotting. All of these things are within allowable tolerances. These things are plenty strong for the application. So we're just going to dribble the concrete into these things, shovel dirt into the trench to keep uh, an excessive amount from escaping, and uh, wait a couple days before we unwind these things and see what we've wrought. Since we had concrete on the job anyhow, we went ahead and poured the pedestal for the gate operator. It's thick, it's strong, it's got plenty of rebar in it because this thing's going to be taking some pretty serious loading pushing these big gates back and forth on windy days as well as on the calm days. So put enough material in here that it's not going to let you down. I'm not